So last time we saw how the first fundamental form determines the, the length of curves on a surface and then the notion of isometries, okay? <coughs> with all the problems connected with the fact that in general, remember, it would be hopeless, huh? I mean, if, if you end up with the problem of determining whether two surfaces are isometric, be worried, okay? So we have a good proposition. If you can make the proposition work, good. Otherwise, it's a very delicate problem. So similarly, today we start by observing. So next thing is what? I mean, if I give you a curve, of course, the first thing you, com you compute is its length. OK? Now, go up one dimension. And the second thing you might want to know, in general, you will be interested in, I mean, as usual, you will have your chart from some domain u to s, x. So this will cover some part of the surface. And then it's very natural to ask what is the relationship between the, see, basically what we did last time was to determine which is the distortion that a chart does between the length of a curve on a domain in R2 and the length of its image on a surface. That's basically the moral of last lecture. Okay? And this determines the notion of isometries and so on. Now, Second step, instead of taking a curve on the domain, take a domain inside the domain, okay? So, of course, this is an area as a, as a domain of R2, and this will correspond to something on the surface which has an area. Now, the problem is what is the area on a surface, okay? And again, that's the first fundamental form which determines everything. Now, we won't do the general theory of integration. This is about integrals, of course, measures and integrals. I mean, you can take a very abstract approach to this problem, but I will be kind of low level here to, today. So the point is, what is the measure, the infinitesimal measure which determines the area I mean, that you want to integrate in order to be able to speak? So of course, as usual, I will throw on a blackboard the definition, but why the definition is sensible. So the idea is that, go back to linear algebra. If you take two vectors, in fact, in, no, no, not even in R2, but I mean, if you have two vectors, and of course you are imagining this as kind of the infinitesimal picture everywhere. So this is on a plane, and I, I will think of the tangent plane to the surface, okay? So if I take two vectors, how do you describe the area of the parallelogram so suppose these are u, uh, xi, and d. Okay, that's why I was looking for your colleague. I mean, because now this is the triumph of vector products. So do you remember how much is the area of this? I mean, how can you describe algebraically the area of this parallelogram? Okay, so the idea is, of course, is that the area is determined by the, the, the vector product of the of the two vectors in general by the formula. So the area would be, the norm would be this, okay? That's high school mathematics, okay? But how do I determine the, the norm of this vector in terms of norms and scalar products of the two basic vectors? Well, the general formula is, of course, I don't, I don't know whether this has a name, but I mean, okay? Yes, it's a variation of the cauchy schwarz formula or something like that, okay? So that's the idea. So now, where do I apply this basic property, okay, this basic computation? I apply to the tangent space to a surface, okay? And then that gives me the pointwise measure that I want to put on the surface in order to determine the area of domains. So this justifies the fact that now I will define the area of a domain where, so if I take now, I have my chart, and this, so what I'm going to say will work only for domains which are contained in the chart. So suppose I pick some domain, let's say V0, okay? So if V0 is contained in U, and of course I'm assuming that X is a chart on, on a surface S. Okay, basically the question is how do I compute the area of x of v0, 
Okay. So I will I will define so the area I will I will denote it by, like this of x of the zero to be the integral. So I want to write it as I mean comparing it with the area of the domain of v zero with the standard measure in R two. Okay, so here, of course, this, this will have coordinates u and v. I'd like to put here something like something times the standard measure. Okay, so what is the something? Well, the something is exactly the norm of the infinitesimal parallelogram spanned by the vectors x, u, x, v, the standard basis induced by the chart. Okay, so here, I would, first, I would put the norm the norm of this, okay? But I want immediately to use this. But for these two tangent vectors, what do I get if I apply the general formula? I get the norm squared of xu times the norm squared of xv. So tell me, what do I put there? Okay. Do you agree? Yeah. So this function here, which is again the determinant of the first fundamental form, just square root, okay, is the distortion function for the area. Okay. Now, this justifies the definition, but the definition needs a property because otherwise it's not well posed. For sure, as I did for lengths, I mean, it doesn't matter how I compute length, I mean, the, 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 the notion of length and area should be geometric. They should not depend on the chart. I mean, the chart is just a trick to compute it, okay? So, whatever is written here, it has to satisfy, otherwise I'm not allowed to call it area. It has to satisfy a property. And if, if I have another chart, which contains the same domain, of course. Otherwise, okay. if I do the same thing with another chart, I need to have the same, the same thing. But on the other hand, you know that if I have another chart, E, G, and F will be different. So the point is, of course, every piece appearing in that formula will change in another chart. So the only hope is that the integral of that expression is invariant, not that every single element of that expression is invariant. Okay? So property. So whether this is true or not, we have to find. We have to find out. How do I phrase it? <coughs> in fact, I don't even need that these, I have another chart containing the same domain. So in some sense I can have another chart containing another domain, but I want so I'm computing not the area, yeah, because I'm looking at this object here, not this. I don't care about V0. I care only about what is on the surface. So basically, whatever there is here, let me call it maybe V0 tilde, and then I have another mark X tilde, another chart, but I'm assuming that they cover the same object here, the same set here. Okay, so. Hmm. So if x tilde u tilde is another chart, such that x of v0 um, is contained in uh, x tilde of u tilde, okay, so that's what I really need. And really that the image of what I'm computing is also in the other chart. Then what? Okay, I can erase the linear algebra. Then what? Then of course I have a transformation. I can pass from one domain to the other by using okay, the inverse. So I get, I have a map, let me call it F, from where to where? To U, from U to U tilde, for example, or the other way around. 
so now in my notations, I put all tildes here, okay? So this will be u tilde, this will be v tilde, the two coordinates. So I have a function of uv, which takes what? Which gives me u tilde as a function of uv and v tilde as a function of uv again. So basically now I'm going this way. Okay, so this is f by taking, of course, the inverse with the other thing. And now the question is, how does that object change? So let's do the computation. I can, I can write xu, I do chain rule, no? So xu is what in terms of tilde? <coughs> well, this becomes just uh, du tilde du xu x u tilde, sorry, plus the v tilde. I'm taking the derivative with respect to u. So the v tilde u x v tilde and x u, so the two tangent vectors change in this way with this transformation. The u tilde v x x u tilde plus v tilde v xv. Okay. Okay, so let's do the computation. I know, I mean actually I wrote it as eg minus f squared one half, but it was on the blackboard before. What what is that one? That that one is the, the norm of the cross product of these two. Okay, so how how do I change it if I if I play this game? Okay, so that's what I need to compute. <coughs> okay, let's do it just by looking at the at the blackboard. Of course, every time I take the cross product of some, I mean the cross product is bilinear. Okay, and then every time I cross product something with itself, I get zero. So what is what does survive here? This cross this plus this cross this. Okay. But this cross this is actually minus the same thing. So this becomes du tilde du, dv tilde dv. du tilde du, dv tilde dv minus du tilde dv, dv tilde du. Just Times the same the same thing with the tilde, the same vector. Sorry, here. This is these are all tildes, eh? I mean. Okay. Very good. So, do you recognize something familiar here? Because now, of course, the idea is that I'm taking this function and put it there. So this is the function which I use to define the area. So now the question is, if I compute the area of the same thing, but with x tilde, of course, if I play the definition, I should put tilde, 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 tilde. Okay? So, I haven't written here, but of course the claim is that they get, I, I get the same number. Do you recognize why? Now, what is this? What is this in calculus? If this was a calculus course, what of the Jacobian? I mean, the Jacobian for me is the matrix. It's the matrix of the change of variable. This is the determinant of the, the square root. Well, the determinant of the matrix, okay? So this is the determinant of the Jacobian of, I mean, now I don't try to, of the, of the coordinates u tilde with respect to the coordinates u, okay? So if I use it here, I put it there, what do I get? I get the integral over v0 of the determinant of the transformation times the tilde expression, okay? And then 
I prove the theorem because I go back to calculus. That's exactly the transformation rules for areas, volumes, whatever, in terms of change of variables. Okay, that's the change of variable formula for this thing. Okay. This is an extremely important property. Eh? Remember, the determinant of the, the square root of the determinant of the first fundamental form, I mean, this is something we will, we will see it in Riemannian geometry as a general fact. Now, don't worry about the future too much, but think that here I'm writing the determinant of the first fundamental form. Okay, the square root of the determinant of the first fundamental form has exactly the right transformation rule to obey the change of variable formula for the integrals. Okay, so this term is a very nice measure which changes rightly when I change coordinates. Okay, the moral of all this is what? Is that this is actually equal. So, okay, this was just a comment, but then this computation proves that this integral is equal to the integral of f of v0. So if I take this domain here and I transform it with this map, mm -hmm. I get exactly the same. OK. So the area is well defined. That's the point. That's good. First property. So, in fact, I mean, this is not even a property. This is just a check that I was allowed to use the name area for this expression here. So, just by looking at it, the only other property I see immediately of the area, but it's important, of course, otherwise, again, it would not be a geometrically interesting number, is that this object here is invariant by isometry. See, as for the length, I mean, the length of the curve has to be a geometric property. I hope I convinced you in this course that you have to ask yourself what is a geometric property and what is not. Okay? So, a geometric property has to be invariant under the group which identifies objects in your category. Our category are metric things. So, isometries. So, whatever you define, the first question you need to ask after the fact that the definition is well posed, is whether you are talking about something which is invariant by isometries or not. Okay? So, but now, after the last lecture, you know. Because if I have two isometric things, this object here does not change. Okay? We proved it. In fact, I mean, under isometries, this is more than that. No? It's not... not it's not just the determinant square or square root of the determinant. It's actually every piece appearing now, which is not changing. Okay. Very good. So we can talk about areas. And this is a geometrically meaningful thing. We will come back to areas later. Because actually in this list of transformations or properties, there is another we can complete it with, the, I think this picture is a bit too, too crowded now. We can erase it and do it again. Because there's another class of very important maps. So typically, two surfaces will not be isometric. I mean, it's extremely rare, of course. Okay? Isometric means identical from the metric point of view. But so typically, the question is, if we want to compare two surfaces, maybe they are not, they are not going to be isometric. But, but maybe they share some property, some other property. So the most famous one is the following. <clears throat> okay, again, xu will be a chart of some surface. So then I say that this chart actually is called conformal. Oh yes, why am I saying this? Because of course, if 
You see, it's still on the blackboard as a shadow here. So the area of a domain and the area of the corresponding domain on the surface, of course, will be different. I mean, it will be a little miracle no? if this integral gives you. So if, I, if you compare the area of the domain of the chart, you will just write this. OK, so this is the area of V0 in, on the plane. The area of the corresponding thing on the surface is this, is this new expression here. So of course they will be different. I mean the, the chart will change the area of something, okay? Otherwise, I mean it will be extremely rare, of course, to preserve area in this, in this game, okay? So let's try to look for something which maybe changes the area but not too much or in a way that we can control. That's the idea behind all this. So something is called conformal. If, I mean, in, in words, it's very easy. If it preserves angles, but now we have to find a mathematical expression for what does this mean, okay? Well, first, let me rephrase what does it mean to preserve angles. Still a little bit a mixture of words and mathematics. So I have my chart. I need a picture here. And I have my chart over some domain. What does it mean preserves angle? That every time I have two things, two curves, for example, on the plane, which pass to the same point, of course they will pass through this point with two, with two tangent vectors. So I can compute, I know how to compute this angle here on the plane. Okay? Then I go on the surface, and then there will be two corresponding curves which will pass through some point. Okay. Again, I can look at the tangent directions there and compute the angles between two things. So preserving angles will mean this ang the, the angle computed here and the angle computed here will be the same. Okay. So let's try to write down this property a bit more mathematically. Okay. So whenever I eat, so this is just an explanation of this sentence. Whenever you have two curves, t going to utvt. Now I'm, I'm writing the curves on the plane, and t going to also u tilde t, u tilde t. Okay. Uh, let's say intersecting at some point that I can normalize to be t equal to zero. Intersecting at t equal to zero at an angle theta. Then their images do the same. So x of u of t, v of t, and x of u tilde of t, v tilde of t, intersect at the same angle. Okay, we'll, we'll write down actually specific formula for this phenomenon to happen, okay? But now we start, but actually just to fix words, we will say that the chart is, so this is, a, this is all what it means to be conformal. But we say the chart is called area preserving. If, what I, what I said before, this, this distortion that you expect between computing areas on domains of R2 and areas on the corresponding images on the surface actually is not there. Okay? So the, the areas are exactly the same. If the area of x of v0 <coughs> is equal to the area of v0 okay, for any v0 contained okay? Okay, this is just a bit, little bit of language, but what is the interesting property? That we, we can rephrase these very natural geometrical properties in terms of purely of the first fundamental form of the surface, okay? So let's see how. So properties or propositions as you want 
1. X is conformal. If and only if P is equal to G and F is equal to 0. Okay? So it will be very simple to decide whether something is conformal or not. Let me phrase everything and then we prove everything. So XU is area. Can, can I write down an area preserving property? Well, this is area preserving. You can guess. I mean, there, there is an obvious property. No, I mean, this is this, the distortion function is EG minus F squared one half. So of course, you can guess what is the theorem. I mean or the property. When is area preserving? When this fun if this function is identically equal to 1, well, then of course, the integrals are actually the same. Now, the, so the interesting arrow is the other way around. I mean, in principle, these, not, these integrals could be the same even if the function could, in principle, be different from 1. But actually, we will see immediately that this doesn't happen. So, of course, here, it doesn't matter that I put the square root. Because, <clears throat> okay, okay. Let's uh, let's check them quickly. Proof, especially the first one. I think it's a bit more interesting because it's newer for you, for sure. So, I haven't raised, fortunately, this intermediate step because if I want to check that something in conformal is, I really need to take these two curve, two curves intersecting assuming they form an angle, and go and check what's on the other side, on the surface, okay? But unfortunately, I need to write down what is this angle theta. I need to find a mathematical expression for this theta, okay? So, <coughs> how do I write it? I mean, how can I mathematically express this thing? Of course, in terms, of the tangent vectors. So of course the tangent vectors will be just u dot v dot at zero, u tilde dot v tilde dot at zero. That's those are the tangent vectors. But how do I how do I compute the angle between two directions? Well, I don't really compute theta, it's easier to compute cos theta, you know, to be kind of with a scalar product. And remember that of course I never said, and in fact I will never know whether these are orthonormal, both orthogonal and normal. I mean, in general, this would be a two, any two vectors, okay? So, unfortunately, the expression becomes a bit, in terms of all the derivatives of this, what do you say? It will be the scalar product, okay? So it's u dot, u tilde dot. Let me write it in this way, or minus, or uh, sorry, plus v dot, v tilde dot. So this is the scalar product of the two tangent vectors. But then I have to divide by the norms, no? So it's u dot squared plus v dot squared one half, u tilde dot squared plus v tilde dot squared one half, okay? Okay, that's, that's for the domain of R2. Let's see on the surface what, uh, what is what is happening. We need to compute the tangent vectors to the corresponding curves. Okay, so I need to take x of this and compute the tangent vectors. So of course the tangent vectors will be what? Well the first one would be u dot xu plus v dot xv. No? That would be the tangent vector to the image of this. The other one of course will be just u tilde dot xu plus v tilde dot xv. Okay, now I have these two vectors here and I play the same game, of course, because the fact that I'm in R3 doesn't change anything. So, so good luck, because now it's the triumph of chain rule here, no? So, of course, 
let me call this, so here I call the angle theta, let me call it phi in, while I'm proving it, the angle here, and then I will compare them. So what is cos phi now? Well, cos phi, let me give names to these vectors. Let me call this xi and this is eta. I play the same game, so I just say that this is the scalar product between xi and eta divided by xi eta. Okay? Let me not do it for the moment because, well, actually, there is no escape. I really have to do it, no? So, you dot, you till the dot. I mean, I mean where, where am I going? I want to, find, I want to throw in the, the first fundamental form. So I'm happy to use the vectors xu and xv, but then unfortunately becomes what? u dot, u tilde dot, xu, xu, plus, it's not a twice, huh? no? because they are different now. X, xu, xv has u dot, v tilde dot, plus, u tilde dot v dot. Of course, it's symmetric, but they are different. So times f plus v dot v tilde dot g. And this is the scalar product. And then I need to divide by the norms. So what is the norm of this in terms of the first fundamental form? Well, it's u dot square e plus twice u dot v dot f plus v, v dot square g to the one half. Then look, same expression with the tilde's, okay? Now, so now the point is, how do I decide whether this is equal to this? The first one, which who objects that this is an equality between the costs and not the angles, is expelled from this course. Okay. <laughs> so I, I'm really said, saying that this I mean, the costs are the same as the angles, and you justify it for some in some way. Now, well, of course, let's see. The, there should be always in these properties. Of course, there's always there should be always an easy one. I mean, if I assume this, it should be conformal. So let's check this first. If, e is equal, if f is equal to 0 and e is equal to g, what's happening here? part is going the other way around. I mean, suppose that these two expressions are the same, and then we need to deduce that E is equal to G and F is equal to C. But then, actually, let me leave it a, a little bit like for an exercise for you, because I, let me just tell you what do you do. The point is that, of course, you have a lot of freedom in choosing which curves. I mean, this has to happen for any curve. That's the freedom you have. So, for example, and this is a domain of R2, so you can choose, for example, the horizontal axis and the vertical axis. Why not? So suppose that the first curve is this one and the second one is this one. I mean, why this? I mean, now, now you see the proof, no? Because if, if this is the case, what, what are you saying? Oh, actually, everything here, I mean, this has to be the angle at t equal to 0, no? I mean, so you compute this. These are all functions of t now. So you, took, you take it at t equal to 0, t equal to 0. But here, that means you are taking what? If I take the horizontal curve, it means that u dot is equal to 1 and, u, and v dot is equal to 0. And you, and you throw in the vertical line, which is the opposite. Then everything disappears except an expression with e and g. 
And then you play the game with these two lines, for example. Okay. Now, what, now that you know that E is equal to G, you rotate by 45 degrees, you play the game, and you find that F has to be equal to zero. Okay? So, good. Okay, so the, the end of the proof is the exercise for you, but as I said, this is uh, now automatic. And what about 2? Because again, it was obvious that if this function is constantly equal to 1, the map is area preserving. But why? how do you argue the other way around? Well, the other way around is the typical argument. So now let me erase uh, the curves on my pictures. We are left with, now, now we are speaking about areas of domains. No? So we have this V0 here and the corresponding thing here. And we are saying, how is it possible that the area of V0 is equal to the area of its image? Okay. But you see, again, you see what made, what made everything work for curves here for the conformal? The freedom of choosing the curves. Of course, for part two, now the question is, how do you use the freedom of choosing the domain? Because this has to be true for every domain. Okay. So you write down, I mean, now you don't even, it's the definition, what is the definition of area? But now you play with the fact that you can take any domain to deduce something. And in particular, you can take what? You pick a point inside. But for example, you can take a ball of some radius. I mean, for the, if the radius is sufficiently small, it has to stay inside the domain. OK? And then you let the radius go to 0. And this, for any radius, these two things have to be the same. The area of this ball here and the area of the corresponding ball here has to be the same. But you see, now, what, what is the limit of the integral on one side and on the other side? Well, it's exactly the function, the distortion function in the measure. Okay. I mean, this is pure calculus. Eh? It's not absolutely here. Geometry has nothing to say. Okay, so that's the way you make appear the function, which is in front of the U D V. Okay, by taking the limits with balls. Okay. So in particular, you see, it's like I mean now. Okay, I consider this proved. Okay, but now. Suppose that you mix the two. Why, I mean, why people have thought about this kind of thing? Because, as I said, the moral is isometric almost never. I mean, give me two surfaces. If they, if they are isometric, it's a complete accident. But we have split the isometric condition in two. Because, you see, if both holds, well, then equal, f is equal to 0, and d is equal to g, and that would be 1. So that means they are both 1. Okay. They are positive, so cannot be minus 1. So if they are both conformal and data preserving, then it's actually an isometry. So we have split the isometric condition into two things weaker. So possibly two things will not be isometric, but maybe they are conformal, or maybe they are area preserving. Okay. In particular, this is just referred to the chart. So really, in terms of iso isometries here, we are asking whether the surface is isometric to the plane. Okay? Because the two, which is the second surface here. The second surface is R2. Okay? So of course, you can extend all this to any other surface. But I mean, here, strictly speaking, we are on the plane. Okay, we will play a little bit with some exercises. I mean, about, I mean, of course, the obvious question is, but do they exist? I mean, do, can, you, can we produce interesting examples of conformal maps or area preserving maps which are not isometric? Because otherwise, actually, you know already many of them. For example, the stereographic projection from the plane to the sphere or vice versa is a conformal map, which, of course, has no hope of being an isometry. Well, of course, I don't know. How do you justify? Because actually, you should know in 40 minutes. Well, okay. 
why the plane and the sphere are not isometric. Okay. It's not obvious. Well, said in this form, they are not even homeomorphic. Of course, the, 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 interest, the, 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 the right question would be whether the sphere minus a point and, this, and the plane are isometric. OK, so in fact, in fact, that's our next step. Okay. So freeze it, uh, all this is now frozen up to some interesting examples in the next few lectures. Okay. But some of the things we discussed will appear also in the proofs. I made some comments at the end of last lecture about the fact that in my culture, if you can, ref if you can say that a Greek thought about something, immediately this becomes an important problem. So you should learn the story about the grave of Archimedes when you speak about these things. Okay? Archimedes was probably the greatest mathematician of, every, of all times, at least here. So he, the story, the legend says that he decided to put on his grave this picture. Well, this picture, this sculpture. Okay. So people have looked for thousands of years for something around Sicily of this form. Okay, because actually nobody knows where he was buried. Okay. And why is that? Actually, it's really amazing. Yeah? The fact that if Archimedes knew that here, that these two things, there is a there is a, an area preserving map. Okay. In fact, I think it's fair to say that. Archimedes was really new calculus. Okay. In some forms which were different from the way Leibniz and Newton rediscovered. Okay. But if you are able to prove that the obvious map here, there is an obvious map from the cylinder to the sphere, which is just the projection, the horizontal projection. The horizontal projection, of course, has no hope of doing anything interesting in terms of isometry. Okay. So if you even suspect that this map has an interesting metric properties, like being area preserving, it means for me it means that you know calculus. Okay. That's what he he knew. Okay. So now it's an exercise for you. Okay. Write down this map and prove it's area preserving. Now it's a make, yeah? I mean, draw a domain on the cylinder, compute the area. Throw it on the sphere by compute the area, and this should be the same. OK, now let's change subject, because like, let's say it's not really changing subject. What are we doing? What is the philosophy of the last, last lecture and this one? Try to express as much as possible geometric properties of a surface in terms of the first fundamental form. So length of curves, area of domains, angles between directions. Okay, so that's the moral up to now. But now we come to the real substantial thing. For the next 45 and 40 minutes, we, are we will try to write down curvature in terms of the first fundamental form. Seems hopeless. Because the definition of every curvature that we know is actually involving the second fundamental form. Okay, so now, now we pass to this other step. Are we able to write down curvature in terms of first fundamental form or not? We have a preliminary, preliminary uh, theorem, which actually is beautiful by itself. So the setup. Now it's slightly more complicated. So the picture, let's draw the picture here, but I need a bigger picture. So I have a surface S. I take a chart as usual. Okay. But now I need to put another object into the game. If I'm going to speak about curvature, sooner or later I will have to speak about the Gauss map. So let's draw it. So here we have this chart, and now we have the Gauss map N, which goes to S2. Okay, so let's say here I have a normal vector like here, so this means this point will go more or less here. Okay, so if this is P, 
this n of n. So these are the objects which come into the game, of course, when uh, you. So we have xu, and now the setup is the following. We take a point inside my domain P, and you can take a sequence. Now, now I will be a, a bit, a little bit sloppy, but I mean, no, there should be no confusion. I take a sequence of domains, could be balls, but doesn't really matter. I mean, balls centered at this point of radius going to zero, for example. So I will call vi a sequence of domains inside V, or actually, sorry, UI. Let me not change notations from my notes, otherwise. Uh, OK, UI. Going to, so UI will be a sequence of domains contained in U for any I, such that, OK, this is the symbol that I'm not going to justify properly. OK, so what does it mean for a sequence of domains to convert to a point? But no, I'm assuming that you are, we are speaking about a ball of radius 1 over i. Okay? So that, that would be good enough. Okay? Now, if I have this, it means I have these domains here. At the same time, I have this sequence of domains, corresponding domains via x. So, so that would be x of ui. But now I have another thing. I have n of x of ui. Who knows? Maybe somewhere here. Okay. Okay, now the game the game now is to compare the three areas of these things. Okay, so now I have the area of the domain UI, the area of X of UI, and the area of N of X of UI. Okay. Now, <clears throat> there is only one, uh, again, a little bit, I don't want to speculate too much. In what I'm going to say, the area of n of x of ui could be negative. Say, so how is it possible? I want to keep track of an extra information that was not encoded into the definition of area, which is whether this map preserves the orientation. OK, so you see, I'm thinking, if this is a local chart, I don't really care whether S is orientable or not, because inside the chart, there is always an N. In fact, the one that I used, OK? But the sphere itself has an orientation that you decide right from the beginning. Okay. So whether this map sends the orientation of, uh, preserves the orientations or not, I will consider it as an indication of plus or minus 1 in computing the area. OK? You see what you mean? If I, if I decide that S is oriented with, the, for example, the, the vertical going up in my picture, and I decided that the, 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 the sphere has the orientation actually going to the center, the one going down. So you see that n, the map n is going up. And, but at the same time, the orientation of the sphere, I decided, it's OK. So I will count this area negative. OK, it's, just, it's the same formula, but with the minus. OK, it's an extra information that I want to keep, in, keep into the game. Okay. So, in terms of numbers, it's the same. It's just a, so this will be called kind of the sign area of this domain n, n, n of x. Okay. So the theorem says the following: If you take the limit as i goes to infinity. No, I have this sequence uh, of the areas of n of x of y divided by the areas of ui. You see, what is this? Well, what is this is the magic of Gauss, but 
at least. So this area, by my assumptions, so the denominator is going to zero. Okay, so this is the ball of radius one over i. Okay, so the, these areas are going to zero. Here, it's a slightly more delicate because what? You take the ball, a very small ball, you throw it on the surface, and then, okay, presumably, if i goes to infinity, this will still converge now to x of p. So, but this can start making distortions. And then, if this was not enough, I use n, okay? But n, again, presumably, will preserve the property that these, now these are not balls anymore. I don't know the shape, but they will kind of converge to the central point in some form. n will do the same. So this is really a 0 over 0. Okay, so the question here is, to at which speed these two numbers are going to zero? Are they going at a comparable speed or not? Okay. So this is really... This is really amazing, huh? So the Gauss curvature is exactly this. And that's why, you see, I wanted to keep track of the negative of positive, because the Gauss curvature is not, exact, is not always positive, of course. And otherwise, I should have put absolute values, OK? I mean, when you see something like this, you say, OK, the guy was smart. Huh? And actually, this is essentially I mean, what passed into history as the remarkable theorem is the next one. I don't want to spoil you the surprise. But actually, this is the core of the, of the remarkable theorem. In, in Latin, it's called the Theorema Egregium. Okay? So, proof. Uh, maybe, actually, I leave you three minutes to enjoy the surprise of this theorem, and uh, we take a little break. Okay?